Good evening. Welcome. Uh, appreciate everyone coming to this five, uh, 5.30 special session. We will begin, um, ask the clerk to call the meeting and call roll. A special session has been held on Thursday, February 6, 2014 at 5 o'clock p.m. for a special session for a presentation on open data innovation. Roll call. McKiernan? Here. Lugia? Here. Maddox? Here. Kane? Markley? Walters, Philbrook, here. Walker, here. Townsend, Holland, here. Thank you very much. So to begin our meeting tonight, we have um, one, um, well, two fun things, but one short fun thing and then one longer fun thing. The short one is we have a special proclamation to recognize a startup company in our own Kansas City, Kansas, um, that has received national and international recognition. So I'm going to ask um, Ms. Cobbins to please read the proclamation and I'll um, come down and congratulate um, the company. It's very exciting. I to uh, Toby's here with iVerify. So if you go ahead and read. The proclamation reads, whereas iVerify is a Kansas City, Kansas-based technology company located in Kansas City Startup Village that has developed several proprietary biometric security applications using images of the human eye. Whereas in 2013, iVerify was named Startup of the Year by Silicon Prairie News and in November were crowned winners of the Get in the Ring competition in the Netherlands, competing against 1,000 companies representing 32 countries. Whereas iVerify has been recognized nationally and internationally as pioneers of biometric secu sec security technology and serve as a shining example of success of the entire Kansas City entrepreneurial community. Now, therefore, I mark R. Holland, Mayor CEO of the Unified Government of Wyandotte County, Kansas City, Kansas, do hereby proclaim February 6, 2014, I Verify Day. First of all, I want to say thank you on behalf of uh, myself, my team, a couple of uh, folks that have joined me here, um, a lot of uh, startups and uh, entrepreneurs in this region. Um, so thank you to, to Mayor Holland and, uh, and to the council for this recognition. You know, obviously, a lot of times we're heads down. Obviously, we're fairly small companies. We're trying to, to grind out our existence. And every once in a while, we get to poke our heads up and um, get some recognition and, uh, and a chance to come before you and, and say thank you. Um, I'll give you just 20 seconds on kind of what iVerify does, and then two or three minutes on, I think the story of iVerify is probably as or more interesting than the technology that we work with. You know, so as a, as a technology, um, you know, what we do is use these cameras, and in fact this camera right here, and turn a picture of your eye into a key that protects your digital life so that you can live a password-free mobile experience. Right? Passwords are a pain, we don't like them, they're, they're frustrating, they don't work very well. Um, the top two passwords in the world are password and one, two, three, four, five, six. Right? So they, f they failed in every sense of the word um, and we're looking to make that easier and yet more secure, again, by using the device you always carry with you and we can do image processing and pattern matching of the eye print, which is a map of the blood vessels and the whites of your eye. Right? So it's pretty cool, you have a fingerprint, you have you know, different kind of biometrics where we're looking at something that is easily identifiable with these devices um, and it's called the iPrint. Okay? Now that's kind of what we do. I think the story of iVerify is, I verify is kind of interesting. So myself, I'm a, a farm kid from Kansas. I grew up uh, just an hour and a half directly north of here, went to Kansas State University as an engineering student, got involved with uh, software and technology companies and became fascinated by kind of the creativity and the, the elegance that you can get with software. Um, left the state for a while, five or six years, was down in Houston, came back to Kansas City, started my first company called Rush Tracking Systems, and as I was, sold that to a private equity, and as I was looking around kind of uh, other things that was interesting, um, you know, one of my colleagues, another entrepreneur, um, said, hey, have you heard about this professor down at UMKC? You know, he's got some really interesting things going around image processing and kind of using cameras to understand the world around us. That's kind of my background is sensors and image processing and using cameras to understand the world around us. And I said, no, I haven't. So I went down and there's a Dr. Reza Derek Shani, who's a professor. In fact, these are a couple of his students that have, uh, have worked with us on this technology. And he had been working since 2007 on this idea of using the blood vessels in the whites of your eye as a biometric. 
and kind of a confluence of things of one, the camera's getting good enough, the things that we do on either of these devices are becoming much more sensitive, the kind of data that we access, mobile banking, um, you know, enterprise data, healthcare data, things are becoming very sensitive. Um, and people doing that everywhere, right? And passwords kind of becoming bigger and bigger pain. So I have a confluence of all those things. I'm like, that's fascinating. We could really do something if we can take that idea, but do it on mobile phones. Um, turns out it, we could. Um, so I, I started the company in January of 2012, licensed the technology out of UMKC, so it was a kind of university-based research, um, licensed that technology. The uh, professor um, became our chief science officer. Um, we began actually um, doing a sponsored research agreement with his students. We now have a scholarship with UMKC. Um, in the past two years, we've raised $3.8 million in funding. Um, we've got 15 people full-time working on this. Almost all of those are located just south of here, 45th and State Line, um, in the Startup Village. Um, there's a whole bunch of other entrepreneurs doing very similar things to the, what I'm talking about right here. And um, It's just been a fascinating ride. You know, we're solving a problem that is truly global. Um, that everybody has, um, whether it's replacing passwords or, you know, we have this fundamental need to, to be, uh, be us digitally, right? So I have an offline identity. You look at me, you know me, you see me, but digitally, that's very hard for us to get a handle on how do I know you are you and not someone else. So we're solving that problem in a very elegant way. And we're doing it with local resources, local talent. Um, you know, I do a lot with Kauffman Foundation. I do a lot with, uh, you know, Sprint's coming in with the Accelerator. Um, and Techstars, um, obviously we've been a beneficiary of uh, Google Fiber. Um, we were the first neighborhood that was lit up with Google Fiber. So I um, tend to be plugged into a lot of those things. So you know, thank you on your behalf for the support and engagement you have given us. Um, you know, I'm one small product of, uh, of kind of a, a larger effort of a lot of different groups. Um, and it's kind of a fun story. One other piece that's also interesting in the story is the uh, professor is an immigrant. Right? He's a first-generation immigrant, came to the United States as a student, stayed as a professor, came up with this idea. So you kind of see this interesting little farm boy from Kansas meets this, um, you know, this immigrant professor, um, comes up with this neat idea, raised some money, and hopefully going to um, you know, create a significant amount of wealth right here in Kansas City. So I'm going to pause for a second. Any questions about what we do or entrepreneurships or startups? Okay. Well, if there are questions, again, you know, there's a lot of us down there. We'd love to, you know, share, share whatever insight we have and kind of the, both the challenges and opportunities that we have. Um, you know, we're a pretty open lot. Um, we welcome you to come down to Start Village sometime. Okay, thank you. I want to recognize um, uh, Jason. Uh, we were put it, we're, uh, Jason Banks on my team. We're putting together this presentation tonight on um, data and innovation, and he had wanted to recognize I Verify, and he said, "Why don't we do it on the same night that we're talking about data and innovation?" And so um, that's why we brought it to this session. So congratulations again. Keep up the good work, and how we support our entrepreneurial community in Kansas City, Kansas, is very important. Um, how we move that forward. So to move from external entrepreneur to kind of internal, um, this idea of open data and innovation is really an issue across the nation. As I've traveled to um, different workshops around the country, one of the hottest topics in cities and counties, local government, state government, federal government, um, is the issue of open data and using data to make data-driven decisions because the data is not just um, something that's cool, it's something that's extremely useful for innovation. And so um, tasked Jason uh, Banks with coming up with a uh, presentation, reached out to the experts. Uh, Rebecca is here tonight. So I'm going to ask Jason to step up and do a, a more formal introduction, and then we'll have the presentation, have plenty of time in this session um, for questions and talk about how this can impact Wyandotte County, Kansas City, Kansas. Thank you, Mayor, Commissioner, Mr. Hayes. Uh, for those of you who have had the opportunity to sit in a room with myself or Mayor Holland you know, any time in the last several months, you've heard us talk about innovation and open data. Um, fairly, relatively new phraseology and terminology for our organization, 
Um, but these are terms that, that many cities and counties and state governments across our nation are using more frequently. Um, a lot of those organizations find themselves um, in a similar position as, as we do here, kind of at a crossroads and uh, being forced to, to kind of redefine uh, how you allocate resources and how you plan um, in terms of looking ahead and trying to uh, put your city um, in the best position to prosper uh, long term. Um, so that said, uh, open data and civic technology are two ways that um, organizations across our nation have found to move the needle and, and again, really put their, or their organizations in a sustainable position. So that said, we are fortunate to have a guest, uh, the expert, as the mayor called him, uh, the Sunlight Foundation, who have joined us this evening. Uh, more specifically, Rebecca Williams, who is a policy analyst with the Sunlight Foundation. And I see the clerks handed out uh, bios and information on the agency. So I won't read it to you, but I will say that uh, as I talk with my peers, uh, the Code for Ameri America Network, um, and several folks, the Sunlight Foundation is recognized as an industry leader in terms of helping cities um, navigate this discussion around open data and civic technology. So with that, I'd like to welcome Rebecca Williams to lead off this presentation. Thanks. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So my name is Rebecca. I work at the Sunlight Foundation. Uh, the Sunlight Foundation is an open government organization. We've been around for about seven years. Uh, traditionally, we've focused on federal issues, so money and politics. Um, campaign finance, that sort of thing. Uh, transparency in government, the, the idea that you're supposed to know what your government is up to. Can you pull the mic towards you just a little bit, please? Yeah. It, does it go Too down? short. There we go. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go a foot shorter than everyone in the room. Um, so, yeah, so traditionally Sunlight has focused on federal issues, but the top of last year, uh, we got a Google.org grant, and that's actually when I joined Sunlight. Um, prior to that, a little bit about uh, my background. Uh, I went to law school a bunch of years ago, then I got my master's in city planning, and I was actually working in between um, housing nonprofits, and I worked in code enforcement in Springfield, Massachusetts at one point. So I've worked for government for a short amount of time, so my heart goes out to all of you guys. Um, and then after that, I was doing some city planning work in New York City, and uh, in between contracting for the World Bank on smarter cities issues, uh, I was on the side for fun researching open data policies. And then Sunlight Foundation got this money from for Google.org. They saw that I had was doing this research and they like scooped me up and sent me down to DC. So the Sunlight Foundation, the way our organization is structured, we have like about a third policy wonks, a third developers that actually work with open data on a regular basis, and like a third reporters. And we definitely, having our organization structured that way, we understand the different uses that you can uh, have for open data. So um, when we're talking about open data, we're talking about this culture shift between government information and technology that exists today. Uh, there's a Pew study that came out in 2009, so several years ago now, where, where they asked people where they were getting information about their government, and they found that a whole chunk of people were looking for government data on the internet. So one of the arguments for, for getting more data online is that's where your citizens are looking for it. Um, when we talk about the open data definition, so, so data is um, anything that the government collects, your public records, anything that you're doing, but um, to make it truly open, there, there's several layers to it. So we're talking about things being administratively open. So proactively online instead of having to FOIA for it or ask for it or, or go to a, an office and, and get it copied for you. We're talking about things being cost free and license free and then technically open so you can make apps and that sort of thing. You have questions? Okay. Um, so um, technically open means open formats, having things being machine readable, bulk downloads, all these things enable um, machine automation and can help um, get that information to more people at once. And I'll, I'll dive deeper into each one of these things as I go along. So why open data? It's, it's a lot of work to get your information online, but there, there are all these benefits to it. Um, some of them are about transparency and accountability, the things that Sunlight has traditionally been interested in. 
Um, but there's also, you enhance efficiency. There's just basic analytics to see how your city is run. Um, this is uh, efficiency that can help your citizens, but also just help your internal government operations. Um, you can improve service quality, uh, track commerce, and increase public participation. So I'm gonna share like a couple anecdotes that I've seen from cities around the country that have open data applying to each one of these. So one of the best uh, examples of transparency and accountability is uh, New York City last year created um, a spending portal. They have more detailed information about how their tax dollars are spent than a, a lot of smaller cities. And the software that they've created is all open source, so the idea is that other cities can redeploy it at some point. So if you open up your financial information and you have somebody on hand that, that wants to redeploy this, they can. And New York City actually went the extra mile to partner with uh, what we call legacy vendors, like the old time vendors that cities are contracting with. So I think this works with CGI, Oracle, and then one, one other vendor as well. And this is all open source code available for cities to reuse whenever they want. So in enhancing efficiency, I have another New York City um, anecdote. I came from New York, so I have a lot of those. Um, there's a nonprofit in New York City called Datakind. They used to be called Data Without Borders. They're a bunch of data scientist nerds that go out to nonprofits and cities and crunch their numbers for them and come up with solutions they didn't know existed. Um, and they did this one project in New York City where they're crunching their parks data with their through and one data. And they found that if they were pruning trees, it was a 22% less likely that they would fall on people later on. But they crunched these numbers together and could actually like prove like we should go out and cut trees down more and then we save more lives and we save more money. But they took these two different data sets from different parts of the city that people weren't looking at and crunched them together and came up with efficiencies. Uh, you can improve service quality. Um, in LA, they opened up um, the response time from their fire departments. And you could see if you lived further from a fire station based on traffic, it, the LA Times actually did this. It wasn't the city, it was, it was journalists with city data evaluating how efficient these things were. So in theory, now that the, uh, LA has this information, they can improve their service quality, maybe move stations, maybe just be aware that this is, these are the differences and account for those accordingly. Um, you can also track commerce. There's, there's been a lot of interest um, from a variety of groups doing reports on that. A, a lot came out last year. Um, McKinsey did a study. They, I think they found it was five to seven trillion dollars of untapped commerce from open data. Um, they have a lengthy report that the chart on the left is from them. Uh, a lot of these industries are around health and energy and transportation. That's where they found the most um, opportunity for um, economy growth. Um, and then uh, there's uh, something called the Open Data 500 that the GovLab did last year. So it's uh, like the Fortune 500, but for open data companies. So they went through and found the companies that were using open data and how they were making money off of it. Uh, Socrata is has also done a user base roundup. They, they have it all in a spreadsheet form. So you can actually see which companies are using open data and what kind of companies you might draw to your city if you opened up your government information. And then lastly, you can increase civic engagement. This is something that I think the open government world has been trying to figure out for a long time. Um, I know certainly when I was doing city planning work, getting people to show up for public meetings, it's always the same people and it's aggravating and it feels obligatory. But in theory, technology should make all of this better. Um, one of the great examples um, involving open data was in Philadelphia a few years ago before they even had um, a formal open data policy they held something called an open data race where they had a bunch of nonprofits um, state which government data they were really interested in to further their mission. And then they hosted what, what that would be and then they had citizens vote on which projects they liked the most and then the city would prioritize that data release first. So it was engaging nonprofits and citizens and it helped cities sort out which data was most important to release. So those are some examples of why you might open data. I'm gonna share an example of what the uh, Sunlight Foundation did where we actively open data through our uh, developer community. 
So I, four years ago, we started um, a project. I think we had one person on staff working on this, and then it was a bunch of volunteers, where we started scraping all of the state legislature sites. And um, then we event eventually got funding, and we had a whole staff working on it. And last February, they officially finished all 50 states. If you check out um, openstates.org, you can search for any information about legislatures, any keywords. It's all in one place, the same interface. Um, this is really exciting if you want to do any sort of cross-state research, and it's all free. So since we're a nonprofit, we provide this information. We have a bunch of journalists use it. Um, I use it in my research all the time. I keyword open data, and, and then I can see which states are talking about it in different bills. Uh, Sunlight Foundation also, um, the first thing we do to create an app like this, this is a, a website and also a mobile app, is we have to scrape the data and then create an API for it, and we provide that API in the bulk data so people can include this information in their apps. So if, if they have a bike app in Massachusetts, they can include the bike laws very easily. What's an API? So API stands for Application Programming Interface. And it's, um, the simplest way to put it is it's this structured thing that you structured information online that computers can usually pull from. So it's not just a spreadsheet, but it's a, it's a format online, but it's live. So if you're a programmer, you know that you can make an app that's always pulling from our live information that's available online. And the way Sunlight does that is we have um, API keys that you can sign up for. So we make sure that nobody's like pulling everything every second, like crashes our site. That's how we manage it. But it's available online to pull from easily and to keep it up to date instead of just like downloading a spreadsheet over and over again. Um, another tool that Sunlight has created um, is Scout. And Scout works with Open States. It also works with our um, Congress app. So Scout's an alert system, so you can type in a keyword, you can type in open data, and then get an email whenever a state introduces an open data law, which is what I do, and it's very easy. Um, but open data, before we scraped all of those state websites, we couldn't have created tools like this. So you couldn't have easily gotten an email whenever, whenever a state introduced something. But if every state provided open data, it'd be really easy to build these tools on top of it. We're actually, so Sunlight's um, expanding their open states work to the city level now, and it's called the Open Civic Data Project. It's actually um, gathering the representative and bill information for cities. It's part of a larger um, Google Civic API that's available. So we're, we're now trying to do what we did for open states at the city level. But the, of course, there are a lot more cities than there are states. But if you're interested in, um, applying the open civic data schema, you could potentially um, be in our, our next open states version for cities. So anyone that wants to talk to me about that afterwards is happy to talk about it. So um, what I do, I, I don't work on any of those labs projects. So I'm in the policy department and what we have used to talk to cities um, about open data with is a, our series of open data policy guidelines. There are 32 provisions, there are three different buckets, and I'll, I'll get into what those are. I, I touched on them a little bit already. Um, but they're, they're guide points with examples. It's, it's not straight up model legislation, but just these are the points that you should be applying to a larger open data policy, or even if, if we've seen some cities and states start um, legislating specific open data policies, like open tax data or open GIS data policies, like they're applicable to everything. They're just general open principles that uh, we found the best practices for each. So I'll talk a little bit about what those three buckets are. Um, the first that we've identified is being really clear about what data should be public. Um, this is something uh, different jurisdictions have approached differently, but um, Sunlight Foundation's position is that you should set the default to open. We've seen several places do this so far. Um, the, federal government has just done it with an executive order from Obama last May for agency data. And then Louisville has done it and New York City has done it. But the, the premise is, is that going forward, your data should be open and would be open. Like your new default is to have it open unless there's a legal reason that it's not. Um, we also talk about building on precedent. So open data laws uh, started 
existing in 2009, and we saw some uh, policies, like memos, that sort of thing, pop up earlier in 2006. But way before that, we've had public records laws and right to know laws and freedom of information law. And if you build on those laws, um, not only do they have the exemptions built in, but they have all, all of this history. Um, so we encourage throwing back and defining data under those terms. Um, next point is appropriately safeguarding sensitive info. If you specifically cite in your policy that the exemptions of your public records law apply, that, that already covers you for a lot of things. And then if it, we've seen a bunch of cities come up with a variety of security checklists at this point. So I think there are actually a lot of, it's one of the concerns I hear a lot when I'm like, let's get your information online, is like, what about the, sec the security issues? And there are, there's a lot of guidance out there now to make sure that you're not putting personal information online. And then the, the last point is really just to make sure you're addressing all government information. This means um, information that you already provide online. Maybe you're not providing it in an open format, but it's like a GIS shape file that you can open up. Or it, it's also information that you have that you, you've never put up before, but it should be public, that you can FOIA for and doesn't have public information. And it also um, opens up a question about when you're contracting with vendors that are collecting government relevant information, you should consider um, adding provisions to those contracts saying that the data they collect will then um, have your open data policy apply to it. Um, the details of how to make that data public um, get very um, technical. Um, we've seen some really good uh, technical guidelines from New York State and then ag again the federal policy last year where they go through um, like specific details of like exactly what open formats you should use and exactly how you can get those formats from what you already have. Um, so we also encourage bulk, do bulk downloads. It's just like being able to download the spreadsheet and then APIs, like if that's like the, I don't know, the third level. Um, if you can provide the information structured APIs, it makes it easier for apps and stuff. Um, the next bucket I think would be um, publishing guidance, um, making sure that you're clear about um, what your licensing will be for certain data sets. A lot of uh, copyright gets tricky with local gover government information. At the federal level, um, no government data applies to the Copyright Act, so it's like very easily understood that it's in the public domain, but things get like tricky and you should be explicit about what license you would want to have apply. We, we'd like to see open licenses um, because uh, federal government information is already in the public domain and these are tax dollars creating this information, so ideally you'd want your citizens to be able to reuse that easily. And then specific metadata schema, just being really clear um, having a structure up front based on what your agencies or departments are using now so that in the future you can catalog this and link it more easily and develop those insights like the, the, the tree thing I was saying earlier. Um, a New York State has some really clear metadata schema examples right now. And then lastly, just talking about past, present, and future data. So this is about potentially scanning information that you already have and getting it online. Um, routinely updating your current information, and then also thinking about if you if you have an open data ecosystem, what does that really mean? When you're collecting data, you'd want your departments to be able to e-file that easier. Easier. So just classic electronic filing, or they're developing apps now. I think back to my code enforcement days where you can have your inspector go out with a smartphone instead of having to write that down on paper and then you scan it and then you in a folder. Uh, and then the last, last bucket's about implementing the policy. So this is, this is why policy is so important. So we've seen um, the open data laws crop up around the country. I'll, I'll show you a map in a sec. There's like 25 or 26, 27-ish now. Um, but m a lot of places are doing this sort of without a formal policy in place. So they have like an open data portal. I think almost every state now has an open checkbook. But there, there's terms of use to the portals, but there's not like a, a clear policy as to when you're updating things and who's in charge of it and what these timelines are. And it's so important to get that in place. You can make those as 
ambitious or as reasonable as you have to, but having something really clear in, in place, making sure that you update data will make that valuable because we've seen some places where they will stand up a portal, upload something, and then just never touch it again. So it's like a year and a half later. And that, that's not valuable. That's not, that's not good for anyone. Um, so establishing clear guidance and oversight, whether that's um, somebody in the department that should be in charge or creating a new position, um, creating a, a data inventory. Before you start um, this whole process, we really recommend having an inventory where you say this is the data that we can put online publicly easily. It's, it's like good to go. This is data that we actually, we're not sure if this can be public. We have to clean this up. There might be sensitive information. And then the last bucket where this is sensitive information and here's the reason why. Like this is exempted by FOIA, so we will never upload it. But being transparent about what that inventory process is lets um, your constituents and each other like know where you're at and what you have. Um, I've talked to a lot of governments where they just don't even know what someone in another department has or they've had to FOIA their own government for something they need in another department. So just that one step would provide so much clarity. Is a FOIA a Freedom of Information Act? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, <laughs> and then um, including public perspectives. Um, we've seen some places, Montgomery County uh, had an open data town hall last year that I was uh, a part of where they had citizens come and say, this is the data I'd like to see from um, the GIS manager. This is the data I'd like to see in, in terms of crime. I'm a citizen, this is what I'm interested in. And there's a variety of ways you could get that. You could even um, look at what is being FOIA'd for, or like asked for most often, and supply that up front. But it, when you're thinking about the data that government's collecting and that that's the citizen's data, then that could also inform how you prioritize release. And then lastly, just uh, ma mandating future review. Um, we've seen some policies have been updated a few times. Um, the federal policy has, New Hampshire updated their law, and then um, San Francisco has actually updated their, their law uh, four times now. So just going through, um, making adjustments where you need it, best practice. <laughs> Um, so again, our open data policy guidelines can be found on our website and there's a lot more detail under each one of these. Um, so a little bit about places that we've seen stand up open data policies. Uh, there have definitely been emergent best practices. Um, like I was saying, uh, first admin policy was in DC in 2006 and then we saw it sort of like a rush of um, smaller laws in 2009. Um, they're usually just uh, general uh, ordinances that were about like a page long saying that uh, the government was supportive of open government and would, would take the next steps and perhaps would release like high or three high level data sets. And then over time we've seen those get more robust, more specific, um, and we've also seen more data be released as a result of that. Um, in terms of um, what types of cities are passing, these policies, um, most of the big cities have one now. So New York City has one, uh, Philadelphia, Chicago, um, LA just passed one. Most of the big cities are on board, but we've also seen smaller cities start passing these. Um, South Bend, Indiana had an executive order last year. There are 100,000 people. Uh, West Sacramento has um, a law. They are 50,000 people. So we're really starting to see it be more than just New York City who has a huge budget and a huge IT department do this sort of thing. And we're also seeing a lot more states. We had like, um, I think three states passed policies last year and there are seven pending bills right now if you go into Scout or Open States and look at that. And also I will say that out of these like 25, um, about half of them were passed last year or updated last year. So it's really this trend that has sort of started to pick up pace. So in terms of uh, getting started, at Sunlight, we don't try to be too um, authorita authoritative about exactly what you should do, but you should be realistic about what your values and goals are. There, there are a lot of different um, reasons for having an official open data policy. We've seen um, Utah pass their policy because they liked what they were doing with their public records law and they wanted to 
update that for um, 2013. Uh, we've also seen cities like hone in on the, the economic development angle and like really focus on that's gonna be like which data set you prioritize, that sort of thing. Um, setting a clear vision, um, being um, specific again about what you want to come out of this, uh, identifying what your city's already doing, what data is already available, um, how can you leverage that, what can make it easier, uh, buying for public support, getting the public involved, and then just starting from basics. Um, you don't have to have a huge portal, everything in a perfect open format and an API for every data set. Nobody has that right now. But getting data available online, um, realizing that a CSV format is easier for developers to use than an XLS format, and is also uh, doesn't require someone to have Excel, and sort of making those accommodations, like just uh, exporting it in a different format, and having a website where you can download these and updating, that is like step one. So, yeah, the open data guidelines provide a path that you can sort of uh, go down whichever way you're, you're interested in. Um, lessons learned that we've seen over the last couple of years with these open data policies. Um, don't copy and paste one policy ad hoc. Like a lot of people are just like, oh, just tell me what the best one is, we'll use that one. Right now, there's not, there's not a best one. Um, I would point people to New York State or New York City or Louisville, but really the best policy is, well, it's the, the one that works for your city, but it's also sort of a Frankenstein of what's available out there today. So it's like cutting up a lot of, of different policies into one. Um, don't fixate on a, a data portal. Um, we've seen uh, open data policies that are passed as law, but they're essentially just a contract to get a Socrata portal stood up in their city. And like I say, they update it once, but it's not the, this policy, not this internal um, culture shift. And, and also, it, it's about getting data available online. It doesn't matter how you, how you get it there. There's a lot of options. Um, and then don't hide behind vague language. There's a lot of, previously, um, there was less per precise um, timelines and defining what a high val value data set is and who was in charge, all of these things. Um, the more specific you make that information, the, the more powerful the policy will be. And then um, do customize for your community. Uh, I think the, the way they got folks involved, and I forgot which ca Canadian city, they, they got them to um, pass an open data policy after they opened up hockey data and they created like a hockey app, just because Canadians love hockey. I don't, it's just like a good story. Um, do plan for the long term, think about review, don't put anything um, technical in the policy itself, like don't say you should use JSON in the letter of the law because who knows what the format's gonna be, but just be very clear about how it should be open and accessible and reusable, and then have your IT department um, figure out what those tech guidelines are. And then do create actionable guidance. Be really clear in the policy about how this might happen. Um, so just to summarize, some of the critical needs um, we've seen missing from some policies and just best practices that we have seen show up in other policies are setting the default to open. Um, I think setting the default to open sets you up for a, a long-term policy and it also updates those public records laws. And it, as far as I can see, it is the future. So if you, you start with that mindset, you can sort of prepare your timelines in a more realistic way. Um, Wield and build on precedent, like public records law, build on what you got. Um, have departments review their data sets and report to an oversight authority. Often the departments are the ones most knowledgeable about what's going on with those data sets in terms of uh, security or how much work it's gonna take to open them up. So having departments directly involved is important. Um, create a comprehensive data inventory as your first step so you know what's there. Uh, develop a plan for updating and maintaining data sets. You don't want dead links or, or things to go stale. That, that makes your work, work not worth it. Um, require status reports and future review. So next steps are establishing what the goals of the city are and how this could play into it. Um, guiding data release with the strong policy, not a policy could make 
the data that you're putting online so much more powerful, and then implementing these best practices, which the most important being inventory oversight and review. So that is my quick um, presentation. I would also sent around a handout of the best legislative examples. Yeah, they've got them. They've got them? Yeah. Oh, okay. So um, I'm here to answer any questions you might have about this. I've read all the open data policies and Commissioner got several studies talking about this. Thanks, Mayor, and thanks very much for your presentation. Um, it, we were talking about at one of our uh, special sessions recently, this presentation coming up, and I was telling the mayor and commissioners that I have some residents who have already approached me um, because they want to use our data and they're trying to figure out ways to make things more accessible. So I'm very interested in this, and I don't know, Mayor, how you are planning on moving forward, but if it's of interest, I would volunteer my standing committee to take this on as a goal. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a second by Mike Kane, so we appreciate that. I think this, yeah, I appreciate that because the, the reason for this, so let's, let's just back up one second. The reason, the reason for open data, there's, there's two reasons. One, um, it's a wave of the future and pure, just from a pure transparency perspective, the Freedom of Information Act is old school in terms of people can request information, and when people do request information, it takes staff time. So we have to stop what we're doing, pull staff off of other things, and have them go find data and report it out to whoever asked for it. If we had the data set online, then we spend our staff time producing data and not filling orders. So then once the data is online, people can go find it themselves. And so the default is any information that someone could get through a Freedom of Information Act is automatically published online and you don't have to ask for it. You don't, it's, it's there. And using these structured formats um, is very important. So from one, from a transparency perspective, this is critically important. The other critically important piece is it's not just the public and the journalists that gets to use our data, we can use our data. We need to make data-driven decisions about budget, about policy, about efficiencies, about how we're running our organization. And one of the challenges we have is if we want to decide how to best do something, first we have to send some staff to, discover, to, to pull the data, assemble it, and then we can use it. But that often takes time, and it takes time in terms of questions. If we have an open data policy, where that's the default, where we have every department working on publishing their data as it comes in, then by the time we come to ask for the data, it's already at our fingertips. So getting this data to our fingertips is critical so that we can make more uh, efficient data-driven decisions. So I'll give you some examples. Um, GIS data, that's our, our, uh, ma our mapping data. Uh, Chris Cooley works with this um, extensively. So someone wants a map created or they want to know where something is, um, if they want to know how a building zone. So if they want to know how a building zone, they're looking at a commercial piece of real estate that's for sale, they want to know the zoning around it, they call into our planning and zoning department and say, they leave a message on the answering machine, how is that zoned? So a staff member in our product gets that request, writes it down, gets on their computer, finds the information and gets back to that person. A lot of cities have already published their GIS data, so a developer or a commercial real estate broker can go ahead and just pull it up and say, oh, this is how it's zoned. You don't have to call in. It doesn't use our staff time, and our staff can use their time doing something else, and it's faster, cleaner information for the public. So it's a win-win for us to get our GS GIS. The other piece is we're getting ready to do it. We're in the process of doing a survey now with the public we're going to get that information back for our March 8th uh, strategic plan. That survey data is a point in time data um, that, that the clock starts ticking on. As soon as that survey is done, the clock is ticking for it to be old. Um, when you have this kind of open data in a portal where you can get real-time feedback from your citizens, then we have input from our citizens that is current on an ongoing basis. So you can put on your website your code enforcement. You can take your GIS data, enter in all your code enforcement complaints in an open data format, and someone can click on a property. So they, they're thinking about buying a house. They see the house next door doesn't look great. They click on that house, 
and they can see who owns it. They can see how it's zoned. They can see if it's zoned multifamily or single family. They can see how many code complaints have been, how many outstanding warrants there are for the owner who has not responded to the um, tickets they've received. They can see the court history on that property. Um, it's like the uh, car facts of the housing industry um, where you can just go and see the history of that house and what kind of interaction it's had. You could go up and pull up calls for service from the police department at that house. So what it does is it takes all that information and takes all the mystery out of it. And instead of someone having to call and think of how many department phone calls that would take to find out about that one property where it, versus you can click on it and you can pull up the data set because it's open data and it's intermingled across departments and people can use it and filter it. And in fact, our police department can use it. When they get a call for service, the police officers know, the police officers on their beat, they know which houses are which, right? They just learn them. Um, but if they, wouldn't it be handy when the call went out, if there were, the information were already on there on the computer when 911 is called, the dispatcher pulls up that address and all this information can be given to the officer en route about what they might anticipate when they get there. That's the, that's the functional use of this data. Um, fire data, police data, um, the bus routes, a lot of uh, cities have published their bus routes in an open data format. And so you can use your smartphone and people are writing apps to catch the bus and it'll use your GPS on your phone to see where you're standing and it'll tell you when the next bus is coming and where it's headed. I mean, that's, that's real technology that's happening in cities across America right now, but it's because they publish their data um, in an open format. The, um, the other piece that was very important, it's one thing to publish our minutes, to scan our old minutes into PDF format and post them online so people can look at it. It's another thing to post the minutes of our meetings in a live format that can be searched so that people can go in and search for keywords. If they say, I want to know when everybody's talked about um, goats. How many times, is, you know, I've got, I want to buy a goat and I want to know what the commission thinks about goats. You can type in a keyword goat and it will pull up from our minutes when we've talked about goats, it'll pull up our, our ordinances and our uh, resolutions about our livestock program. I mean, it will allow citizens to have this at the tip of their, finger, at their fingertips. But most importantly in the short run, it allows us to make better decisions about how we're running our city. And that is the critical component. Now, I would say this, when the most important thing that we're going to need to talk about, and the reason you might be thinking, well, why are we talking about this in budget session? We've targeted all of our first quarter commission meetings to budget-related topics. If we're going to move in the direction of open data and data-driven decisions in our departments, we're going to have to create some capacity in our organization to be able to handle this. This data is not going to pop out of the sky. It is going to have to be culled by someone who's tasked with the authority and the responsibility to go get it, to assemble it, to code it, and to put it out online so we can use it. Um, we can't, there's no magic wand. It's a lot of work. But there are, um, there are new positions that are being created in cities across the country called data specialists or um, data officers, chief data officers, whose job it is, they work in an, in an administrator's office level, and they have the authority to help each department implement their open data policy and to get the data online in a usable format. Because unusable data, you just will not have it. It's got to be in a usable format. So when we talk about uh, capacity, in order for us to use it, we've got to have someone whose job it is to get it and make it accessible. And that's going to create a capacity issue that comes to budget because we start talking about salary and we start talking about, um, you don't need to create a whole new department, but it needs to integrate with our IT department and all of our other departments. So this is, um, this is pretty critical in terms of what we're trying to do with efficiencies in our organization. So any other, any uh, questions or comments from the other commissioners? I'm pretty fired up about it. I know Mike Kane's fired up about it. His committee just got it. Woo! Uh, thank you, Angela. <laughs> thank you. No, that's right.
Yes, Commissioner Walters. His mic, are you mic on? Sorry. I'm interested in um, your description of the three buckets of information, the information that you decide to put or make available mm -hmm. and information you decide not to make available. Could you give us some examples of information that's, that cities are deciding not to make available? I guess uh, one key example of that would be um, New York City has um, limited their data definition to just be structured data and to not, for example, be geographical data officially. So they, they have um, strict technical guidelines where they're um, essentially saying, like, make sure we get all of our Excel spreadsheets online, but not necessarily narrative information that might also be helpful. But they are, um, to their credit, they just passed in December this um, webcasting law that all, all of their meetings had to be webcast. So they're sort of handling their non-structured data under um, potentially new laws that aren't, under, their open data policy is just about a very precise list of structured data. What's structured versus unstructured data? Well, I guess the, the easiest example would be um, like the shape files or narrative formats versus a spreadsheet. And, and the data within maps can be structured, but so I guess uh, the text that you would have in a PDF might not necessarily fall underneath that structured definition. Meeting it with minutes would be unstructured data? Yeah. Okay. okay. So we've seen a bunch of cities um, define data <laughs> slightly differently. So some have been really explicit about um, linking it up to their um, FOIA law, and some have just defined it um, loosely. So it's like government data. They don't even say if it's, it's structured or otherwise, and there, there's no precedent. And it's not clear to me as just a, an observer that wasn't always there when these things were being written as to whether, um, how intentional it is or how um, not thoughtful it has been in terms of what those, those definitions are. So, so non-published data would include personnel records, correct? In terms of people's names. Right. Obviously social security numbers, health records. Um, we could publish aggregate data, for instance, um, every person by position in the organization, their salary is public information. We can publish all the positions and salaries. We wouldn't necessarily publish the names. Though I think names are published in a lot in when it's just salary information. Yeah. But when, when we aggregate healthcare information, like when we look at our claims data, we have to mine our claims data to see where, how we're using that. That claims data, an aggregate can be public information but whose particular health issues is not public information. So for instance, if there are 23, if we, because we're self-insured and there were 23 people who had cancer treatment, we would need to know there were 23 people that had cancer treatment and this is how much that cost our organization. We would not know who that is. You know what I'm saying? We wouldn't know the names, so the data would be, we would protect personnel information that's sensitive, but we would still mine the aggregate data that would help us know what um, what we need to know in order to make better decisions about our health care. Does that make sense? That the way um, New York State is handling a lot of those things right now is, like, well, one, the, the FOIA laws in New York cover a lot of those exemptions. Like, you have laws that are already built in to protect your security and privacy, and if you incorporate those in your open data policy, a lot of it will be covered. Um, one of the things that has come up when they were passing um, the federal open data policy, which is the executive order um, by Obama, was um, the mosaic effect, which is this idea of um, you might accidentally disclose sensitive information through like a series of spreadsheets and you, didn't, you couldn't have seen it beforehand, but someone might connect and then realize it's this person. Um, so they've actually, they've come up with like a very specific security checklist to make sure that that doesn't happen. But in terms of like health and um, education, there, there's federal laws in place that um, your local department should already be familiar with, like HIPAA and, and FERPA, that would, would just still apply. Like, you just wouldn't release that information. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Who knew data could be so exciting? <laughs> right? Um, I do want to give, if I could, if I could give a real life example. So Doug Parisi's here from the police department. And um, I saw him two minutes before this meeting. 
And he said, well, we do this. I said, well, come show us. So I want him to come up and show us um, the real live crime mapping that we do on our website now. And if he can just use the mouse real quick, this is an on-command performance, unrehearsed. Um, and tell us, uh, introduce yourself and tell us your specific title with the department. Uh, I'm Captain Doug Parisi and uh, recently been assigned to the IT department, records and IT. So we keep track of all the reports that come in and put those through the police department um, databases. Um, Captain Rance Quinn is also here, and Captain Rance Quinn, about a year and a half ago, I believe, he uh, started a um, program where they created the data set that she's talking about, and we pushed this out on the server so that different units could access, or different entities outside of the police department could access it. And this group called Spot Crime was one of the ones that did it. So we have linked to Spot Crime. So right here on our KCKPD website, you can see where it says Crime Mapping. So if you cl click on the crime mapping, it explains how the data <coughs> goes into the use. And, excuse me here. and then there's a specific link towards KCK. And so what this does is that this puts in the last 300 incidents or the last two months. Um, unfortunately, we're always at the 300 mark, not the two month mark. But this, uh, they do this for a lot of um, communities across the country. So they don't give specific information about what the crime was, but there was an assault on the J January 30th, and it happened in the 2900 block of West 43rd Terrace. So if somebody was curious about that, they, you know, you can look at the handcuffs um, equate to arrests. There's different icons that uh, show different um, crimes. The, the fist is an assault. And so that's what the public has access to through a third party. So this is where she was talking about the API. What we do is we always push the information out outside of the police department servers and then different entities, if they want access to our crime data, can get it from that data set. And so that's the data set that we create and it's kind of like a universal format and then the companies just need to be able to read that format. Um, obviously they make their money on advertising. <coughs> you can look at different um, information throughout this. Um, when it comes down to, you know, if you just wanted to take care of the arrests, the arsons, and all that. There is a subscription, to, and this is also sub subscription-based, um, so that if you wanted to get very, where it comes into the analytics and different information like searching through keywords, you have to become a member of this spot crime group. But for, for the general public, if somebody wanted to know, well, wait, who did some graffiti down the street, they could click on it. There was some vandalism in the 1100 block of Pacific Avenue on the 24th that was reported. And then if you want more information, that's where you have to be a member in order to get more detailed information. Again, people's information is private and the specifics of like arrestees and all that is not on there. Um, the other thing that is interesting is I've looked through this website, and I gotta, sorry, scroll down to the bottom, is it has information, there was information on like crime percentages um, based on previous years that they have access to, but they also had stuff on property valuations and a decline in property valuations and stuff. And so I don't know where spot crime links that, but basically what they're doing is they're taking de several data sets from, out, from across the UG and they're combining that into one entity here in KCK. So that's and how does the police department use this information, this aggregate data internally? Actually, this is, t I don't wanna say it's too generic, but it's more generic than what we um, would use. So what we do is we kind of dumb this down, take away the private information and push it out. Prior to us doing that, we have a crime analyst and the crime analyst looks at crime, crime trends within the department and he maps those. And then there's certain areas where we'll have an increase in burglaries or an increase in say auto thefts or whatever. Um, on the news, there was a story just recently about someone that was warming up his vehicle and it, it led to an incident. Well, we had found out that there was four incidents prior to that where vehicles had been stolen. So that tends to help us draw in career criminals and suspects that might be involved in the incident that, that happened. And so that's how we use that information is to look at similar incidents. Then we can look at the suspect information from all five similar incidents. And by doing that, we can create kind of a composite of maybe who we're looking for. So even though in one incident, incident you just might have, sub, you know, I, it was a male, 
but in the other one, you're like, he was, they described him as a five foot 10 male or five foot 10 to six foot wearing a black hoodie. And then in a third one, they remember him getting in this vehicle. Then we start looking at all that information and now we all of a sudden can pool those resources to identify people. So there's an example right now where we have open data where the police department is using mining their own data for crime prevention tactics in our community and pushing that data out for the community to use so you can look. Another step that a lot of groups are using, a lot of neighborhood groups um, are linking onto sites like this where they will have a crime watch group and an open chat room, um, which is a little different than just doing it on Facebook because if you do it on Facebook, that's international and anybody can look at it. Whereas if you have a, um, a smaller group um, internet chat room that's just your neighbors are on, then your neighborhood, in fact, you just sent me a link to this. Um, describe the one that, you were, that your neighborhood group was using. Okay, Mayor, so um, the Startup Village neighborhood that we just heard about earlier is also called the Spring Valley Neighborhood Association and they're an incredibly organized group. Um, they have set up a special sort of chat room as the mayor's referring to on Google. It's real easy setup and you subscribe to it or you can link someone to it so they have access. And literally all day long, could potentially be 24 hours a day, seven days a week, whenever people are on that Google chat group, um, everything they type on it goes out to everybody. It's completely transparent, the whole conversation. So some funny situations that I think are, are fun is in the summer I ride my bike through this neighborhood and I have my cell phone with that Google chat room up and the first thing that pops up is somebody in a house saying, I think Commissioner Merguia is riding by on her bike right now. Um, and then it'll go, you'll go down a little further and someone else will say something. The same thing with police. If I'm here at City Hall and something happens in this particular neighborhood, I'll get a pop-up or an email or a Google sort of chat link sort of thing. I'm not sure what to call it. Icon maybe. Yeah, yeah it's like an eye comment um, that uh, there's an officer coming down Francis right now. Um, or the, they'll talk about if somebody's on foot, they're now on Francis, now they're going over to Eaton, and they'll be able to communicate like that at all times, and our community officer, community police officer is on this group as well. It's a great way to share information um, instantly in real time so that you're able to react in the most efficient manner. And with the number of people, it's pretty clear what's your job and what's not. If there's a suspicious looking criminal coming down the alley of Francis and the community police officer is linked into this chat room, it's really not my job to get involved. I'm assuming the community police officer is gonna take the lead and, and make something happen there. No, that's great. So this is another example of how, um, but you all have to collect the data. Yes. And you have to put it out. So what kind of infrastructure, personnel infrastructure do you have in the, in the department to make that happen? Uh, well, we are currently in the middle of a CAD RMS project and our current, what? a CAD computer aided dispatch and a re records management system, kind of two in one. Um, we're upgrading that. Our current system, it was purchased in 1998. So it's very antiquated in the sense of what has happened in the last 15 years. Um, and what the new systems we'll be able to do is we'll be able to help us interface with a lot more agencies. We would like to get to the point where when codes and codes decides they're gonna send two people out to investigate a house, they could type that into say a, a dispatch system. That would send a notice to us and so if something was happening at that residence, then we would be able to say, wait, you don't wanna send those two officers out because there are two personnel out or if something was going on. So what we need to do is broaden that and improve the systems that we currently have. We have, under my command, I have three IT specialists um, one is the manager and then two people. One is permanently assigned out to the dispatch center. Um, and then we are in charge of all the computers, all for the fire department and for the police department. And so I will tell you that that is a small number of people, three people to manage all the computers for the police department, fire department, the dispatch center, all of the laptops, all of the um, desk computers and all the in-car computers. So they're constantly playing catch up. What we'd like to do is get to the point where all of that data, as you said, from the dispatch center, when a call comes out, gets um, sent out to people, that notifications can be made on history, notifications can be made on whether or not the fire department went out and saw that there was a fire hazard, so that when two officers go walk into the building, they know what's going on. 
currently we don't have that. Right. And so the other stuff we're looking at is, as Rebecca mentioned, um, things like being able to do this from your phone. You could send your codes people out and they could talk about the back stairs are unsafe so that when the officers go to that call, they know that that, that back stairs have just been failed inspection and they probably shouldn't use the back stairs. That's the type of information that we need to integrate. And so. No, that's great. Well, thank you for the on-command uh, on uh, opportunity to demonstrate what you're doing with the technology. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, one of the things, too, we made it when we are buying this very expensive new radio system. This new radio system we're buying, $25 million? Our $25 million radio system that's going to integrate police, fire, sheriff, public works, Bonner, Edwardsville, and Board of Public Utilities, integrate all these public employees on the same radio system so they can talk to one another during emergencies. One of the um, components we did not buy yet, but we could, is the software to manage the GPS on all of those vehicles. Um, so this is another, again, when you talk about capacity, one of the things that would be very helpful is if we had GPS in every single vehicle, every police car, every fire uh, vehicle, every BPU vehicle, you could track where they are and where they've been, and you could map routes. You could map out all of the information that could help us be more efficient in how we deliver services. So there's a cost to getting that um, component, but there's also a return on that investment that we need to consider as we're thinking about these different items. So um, this technology push is big, and it all starts. We can't do the kinds of things we need to do with innovation without our data. And so that's why I asked for this presentation tonight. We need to lead with open data, not only for the public, but for our own departments and our own administration to use um, so that we can make better decisions for budget and better decisions for operations. Fair? Uh, Ms. Williams, do you have any other uh, comments you'd like to make for us? Um, I'm available. Um, feel free to email me. I'm rwilliams at sunlightfoundation.com, or you can reach my whole team at local at sunlightfoundation.com if you guys have specific questions or want specific examples. Um, we've been gathering more and more as we've been working with cities over the last year. Um, and also, I would just like to reemphasize that the more you open your data, the more you open your city to innovation that these other cities are going to start having available to them. LA and New York City and Philadelphia, they're going to be standing up applications and things that will only work if you have your data ready to plug into it. So That's great. Okay, any other questions before we wrap up? Thank you very much for your presentation tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, Jason, any closing comments? All right. Well, that concludes our... Um, Unless anyone has any questions specifically about data, that concludes our special session tonight. Uh, we will take about a 20-minute recess, and then we will be back here at 7 o'clock uh, for our regular meeting, and we will also have our public hearing, first public budget hearing tonight. Thank you. We are adjourned. <laughs>